welcome. My name is David Brashear. I'm the director of the Muscarelli Museum of Art. And we're very happy to have you joining us tonight for what is our last program of the season. Our final installment in our Selected Topics in Architecture series this spring. I'm very pleased to be joined tonight by my good friend, Ed Peace, co-founder of Steam and Peace Architecture here in Williamsburg, and just a great all-around guy. Ed and I have worked together on the topic of Frank Lloyd Wright in the past, and so he's really the perfect partner for tonight's program, which is a book discussion like we do each semester at the museum, and this one on the excellent book, Plagued by Fire, The Dreams and Furies of Frank Lloyd Wright by the author Paul Hendrickson. Ed and I have twice taught a course here at William & Mary on Frank Lloyd Wright, an entire four credit semester long course on yes, just one man. And both he and I have lectured here at the Muscarelli on Mr. Wright. So for each of us, Hendrix Hendrickson's book was both a review and a window into places that we had not yet been in the Frank Lloyd Wright story. So Ed, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, David. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, great. Well, I invite all of you attending this session to join the conversation by posting questions and comments in the chat or in the Q&A functions of Zoom, and we'll happily bring your thoughts into our discussion tonight. And I'll be assisted in broadening the participation by our program producer, Laura Fogarty. So as any good college teacher would, I've brought along tonight some of our slides. And I thought I might run through a few that I believe will help us to bring some clarity to the book and also to set the stage for tonight's conversation. So we'll just sort of move into them if, uh, if there are no objections just to put some pictures to some of the words that the author describes. So of course, here is our man, early on and much later on, living almost to the age of 92, born in 1867, as you know, just after the end of the Civil War and living all the way into the early months of 1959. He talked about, uh, the author talked about Wright's first real engagement in professional architecture, and that was helping out uh, Silsby, Joseph Lyman Silsby, with the Unity Chapel, which was built for Wright's uncle in Spring Green, Wisconsin. And Wright involved more on the interior than the exterior here, but this is it. This is the building we're talking about. And of course, um, Louis Sullivan, an important part of the Wright story. Here is the man. Uh, that next very significant position that Wright held early on in his career, his Liebermeister, as he was known to call him, talked about the Charnley House, that project, maybe the last one done in collaboration uh, with Louis Sullivan in the residential realm. They sometimes worked for some of their important clients in the residential space, even though at um, Adler and Sullivan, that wasn't really what the project was all about, uh, but they did do some residences and this looking very different than what, what one might have seen in Chicago uh, in, the, in the early 1890s. Of course, some of the bootleg houses, the author talked about a few of them. This is what they were often looking like. The Winslow House, that turning point. Frank Lloyd Wright sort of announcing to the world a new direction. The Isidore Heller House, uh, experimenting early on with a new architecture, but on a very tight urban lot within the city. And then some of the real groundbreaking, the changing points, the Warren Hickok House in Kankakee, and just that flowing space, you can see it from the dining room, the living room and the library. And then right next door, the Harley Bradley house. Family members in those two adjacent houses. The Hurtley house in Oak Park, just outside of Chicago, where the main living quarters in this particular residence are on the second floor. 
another sort of unique presentation. The Willits House, really a change maker in Highland Park. The Cheney House, really sort of a central point of, of Hendrickson's book with some of the walls in modern times taken down. The Avery Coonley House in Riverside. And of course, leading all the way up to that culminating point, that masterpiece of prairie style architecture, the Roby House in Chicago. Frank Lloyd Wright's home and studio after several editions. And then that's really about it for right now. So Ed, to start, what did you think of the book? <laughs> um, I really liked it. That's a, that's, that's, that doesn't say much, I, but I didn't, I should, that was impressive to me because I quite frankly was sort of um, not entirely enthusiastic about reading it. Cause I mean, as you know, we've both read a lot of books about Wright and have read books by Wright. Although I, I mean, I've read his autobiography but that's been quite a few years ago. But I was really expecting it to be kind of a rehashing of what you and I both have already um, come upon and shared with our classes and other talks. But this was something for me that was entirely different. And I found it aside, and this is something you and I talked about yesterday, the, the beginning of the book is a little difficult to deal with because it's quite, he goes into the gory details of the events at Taliesin uh, in August, 1915. And we both kind of wondered why, if that was a good way to really start the book. But beyond that, it, there's so many, um, new insights and small asides that came from personal letters that he uncovered or interviews with family members or just so much detail about him as a person that was a lot of that was very fresh and in the end you I felt like or I, I feel now having read the whole thing that I have a much more sort of three-dimensional view of who he was um, the good the bad and everything in between and he doesn't he, he doesn't hold his punches. I mean, we see right in all his, the things that are extremely off-putting and kind of reprehensible, et cetera. And then there are those moments of conscience that kind of come through or the tender moments that he does have. I mean, he, he's like most of us, he's a complex creature. But yeah, I just, I, I found it all very engrossing and he's a great writer, um, I think. And he has a, he does have a journalistic background. He wrote for the Post for a while before doing more of this historical kind of research and biographies. But um, anyway, I found it really engrossing. And I would the only for the, our listeners and in the, in the our in the audience, if you it's the kind of book if you are familiar with Wright's work, that's all for the better. But I think even if you're not, at the very least, this is a great kind of springboard to begin to look deeper and to the projects, many of which David showed just you know, at the opening here. So yeah, I think it's certainly doesn't require foreknowledge of Wright and his architecture, but it would help. But beyond that, it's just, a, it's a very, very engrossing and I think gratifying book to read from, from my perspective. Yeah, I think I would agree with you. I think what is really interesting to me is, uh, is, is what you said. And that is that this book can be consumed, credibly consumed by the novice or the expert. And I can tell you, you and I, uh, as, as you and I both know, have done a lot of research into right. Uh, we like to classify ourselves as uh, not being deep disciples of right, but very <laughs> fascinated by the story. Uh, and so for us, Ed and I were talking about this recently, for us, it was sort of a review, but with more details than we had had in some spaces 
than previously. But I think Ed's absolutely right for someone who doesn't have a lot of right experience. Uh, this is a book that kind of brings you through the story. I thought interestingly uh, was how Hendrickson pivoted right around, which is obviously a seminal moment in Wright's life. It would be uh, in anyone's life, uh, the massacre. Uh, but with the massacre, uh, what the massacre really, I think from the author's perspective was emblematic of was Wright's complete self-absorption and his ego. And that's sort of how you introduce it. And it also interestingly is a way to sort of mark um, the first phase of his life and then that long intermezzo and then the beginning of his second phase of life, which starts in the mid 1930s. And I think it is really important to mark Wright's life as sort of that period of incredible growth and growing boredom uh, kind of up to 1910, roughly to uh, you know, his early 40s. So he's a successful architect. Um, but as Ed and I know and will share with you, um, he's an architect who is deeply frustrated by his inability to gain commercial commissions. He really has only you know, a couple handfuls of commercial commissions throughout his entire life. He is largely a residential architect. And that doesn't quite square with him. He wants to be more, but he never really gets there in any meaningful way. And so up until 1910, he's doing a lot of houses. The author, I think, presents it really well that he gets a little um, sort of tired of it. He feels like he's worked it all the way through. And then he sort of comes to this point where he doesn't know what to do next. And what has always amazed both Ed and I is you can have a lull in your career Anybody does. Anybody has the high points and the low points. Uh, but Wright's low point of his career left, lasted about 20 to 25 years. <laughs> you know, that's a whole career for most people um, from uh, the mid teens all the way up through the mid 30s, maybe even the early teens as he's sort of working through some of the problems that sort of culminate with this massacre. Um, and so to me, it's, it's interesting. I, I really did not enjoy the first few pages of the book when, as Ed says, uh, the author went into um, some pretty, pretty graphic detail about what went on on that dark, dark day. Uh, but as I got more into the book, I really appreciated some of the nuances that the author had spent so much time digging into. Ed, for you, um, what were the surprises in the book? Um, I think the biggest surprise, and it's not new for some people, but I I had absorbed the prevailing um, myth about Wright's childhood, particularly relating to his mother. That, um, she, and of course in in the autobiography, he talks about it in his own words, where his father is virtually invisible in that whole story. Because for those of you who haven't read the book yet or know the history, Wright's father and, and mother divorced uh, when Wright was about 16, I think, 16 or 17, and 15, somewhere in his mid teens. And the story was usually presented primarily because Wright. And Wright said it himself in his own words that his father walked out and that was that and left him destitute. And then the whole story of his mother um, wanting him to be an architect, which is all true. And she had provided him with the Froebel blocks as a little boy to you know, learn geometry and all that. All that part of it was true. But the, the myth that the father was a bad guy and a loser and left them alone, he really blows that whole story to pieces and you just see, I mean, it's much sadder than that in a way and that his mother was really probably a very ill woman. She was probably bipolar. She had a horrendous temper, terribly abusive to um, uh, her husband's children from a previous marriage. And it was just, it was just, it was awful. It was awful. Um, and so when he left, it was, it was not, he, it was her, Wright's mother, Anna, her, her, uh, she was the instigator for that whole thing. 
But then what Hendrickson does that kind of makes the story a whole lot deeper and richer, he tells us in great detail about who William C. Wright was. And he was quite an extraordinary man. He, he was a composer of some renown. In fact, uh, this afternoon I listened to some of, some of the piano compositions online and they're just kind of lovely pieces and very melancholy, they tend to be. But he was a lawyer, he sat for the, sat for the law, he was a preacher, all these various things that he was quite good at and he was fairly, he was apparently very charismatic but it seems that his flaw was that he could not stay in one place for more than a couple of years. So anyway, but, but the long and short of all that is that he made Wright's father a, a much more real character and showed and hinted at the influence that he really had on Wright's um, growth as an artist and an architect, just his whole instilling in him this love of music. And of course, Wright came up with this wonderful phrase that um, music or symphony is an edifice of sound. And he used that phrase a lot, particularly in his later career. So but this whole idea that the structure of music is closely related to the structure of architecture seems pretty undeniable that that came from his father. So again, Hendrickson just made, he laid that story out in a much clearer and more complete way than I had ever heard it. So that was I guess there are other surprises in the book too, but that's the one that, that sticks with me, so. Yeah, I, I think that was a great one. And I, I think you're really, uh, you're smart to point that out. Um, and there really were a lot of little surprises and stories and side angles. I think one of the things that intrigued me uh, the most and maybe surprised me the most, and I think we're all, many of us are just sort of coming to learn about this uh, was the fact that his cousin, Richard Lloyd Jones, who was a bit of a sort of in the family competitor in some ways as they were growing up and into the early stages of their adulthood, um, that his brother became the publisher, the owner and the publisher of the newspaper in Tulsa. And I think could be um, at least partially, if not uh, more credited with uh, the Tulsa race massacre, which, uh, which, I mean, I'm sorry to say, uh, was not really part of the common lexicon in the United States until even just the past few years. So I thought that was a really interesting, interesting angle. Of course, it has not much to do with right and, and the story of right and all the different angles that we would be dealing with. I think to me, what was interesting, and I'm not sure I've ever read a book like this before, but was uh, the way that Hendrickson really used his, uh, his experience and background as a reporter to go down what might be considered to be little rabbit holes, uh, to sort of dig deeper in areas that a typical architectural historian uh, or author of architecture, uh, architectural research wouldn't necessarily spend time with, but it helps us understand Frank Lloyd Wright that much more. For instance, um, I think we're all puzzled uh, in the Wright story by his detachment from his family, including his children. It, it, it's really difficult to sort of add that up and come to a place that makes any sense from a uh, normal human compassion perspective. But he sort of tracks him uh, as, as having these special moments or uh, bringing one of his son, young sons along on some project or engaging or peering in the family house window when he was clearly not a part of the family um, and maybe just uh, sort of uh, there to view what might be going on in his absence. And there were just a lot of those stories. We, we got to dig in a little bit more deeply into some of the dimensionalities of these um, extramarital and postmarital relationships that he had. Uh, I'm not sure that I was aware as much of the story of him and Mema uh, Cheney Borthwick uh, being maybe not always in perfect synchronicity when they had decamped to Europe. So that was a bit new, um, at least in my knowledge base. And then some of the hysterics of his uh, later second wife, 
and leading, of course, into his third and final marriage. Um, I was impressed, Ed, and let me ask you um, if you feel the same way. I was impressed by how much Hendrickson had read. He had consumed a lot of the material that you and I have both consumed. I found it refreshing that he had been um, educated in some of the right story as told by the noted architectural historians like Vince Scully and Richard Guy Wilson. Um, also, as you and I both know, Neil Levine has written uh, a couple of books that are really important in more recent years uh, and also sort of visited some important architectural critics and their work in the right space. So he, he really is, a, he's a consumer of the, um, of the collection of right stories and right writings. Um, yeah. What's your perspective? No, I think that I totally agree. And I think what you said in the beginning about his, his being a reporter that he, he clearly brings those skills and talents to this book because he, I mean, he, I can't imagine the amount of time and research and just, you know, walking the streets, going to the buildings, going to the places, finding the people, going into the archives of, you know, these obscure county records in Alabama to learn about Julian Carlton, who was the, you know, he was the servant who killed Mema and the rest of the people. So, I mean, that's an, just an incredible amount. But I think but there's some real fruitful things, some extremely fruitful things came from that, obviously. And one of them that I particularly liked was his quoting from the letters um, of Lewis Mumford and Wright. Um, they had a long relationship over 40 or 50 years. And Lewis Mumford was a critic. Uh, uh, yeah, he was a critic, architecture right? critic and um, generally favorable to write, but not 100%. I mean, he was, and they had a very honest kind of relationship, but the letters that they exchanged, um, particularly after the 60 years of architecture, the big exhibit, um, it, where it was Mumford's um, critique was half was quite favorable and the other half was quite devastating, you know, and very honest and blunt and to the point about what was missing or why he couldn't fully buy into, or he couldn't 100% um, enjoy this architecture of this great man who he knew was, it, and it said on numerous occasions what a you know, genius architect he was. But I just found that fascinating. Again, the, to hear it in their words and Wright's responses to that was, that's, yeah, that level of journalistic inquiry was really, impressive and makes, to me, it's what kind of made the book different from anything else I've read about, right? And of course, those two relationships with Lewis Mumford and with Henry Russell Hitchcock, they're almost lifelong uh, and they do go through their ups and downs and fights and, and tiffs and uh, reconnections. All of those aspects exist in both of those relationships that Wright had. Yeah, yeah. What a, maybe you can spend a little time, Ed, talking about some of these relationships he had with his clients, because you and I have spent a lot of time uh, imparting to our classes and other groups that we've talked about just how important some of these relationships were and just the way that he worked with clients, uh, inviting them in initially to be part of the program and then making sure they knew their place in the ongoing <laughs> relationship. And then, of course, these these partnerships or these friendships or these business relationships that tended to have a little bit more persistence uh, because the uh, the person on the other side of the relationship was someone of means. And of course, Wright was never a person of means because he was a spendthrift throughout his life from about day one. Yeah. And if you look at the important clients, and this is, of course, common knowledge in the right lore, it would be um, Hib Johnson of the SC Johnson company where he did the Johnson Wax building, you know, incredibly important 
um, project for him in 1936, where that was the beginning of his, you know, second career or maybe third career. But um, yeah, so Johnson was an important one. I felt like the book probably skimmed a little bit over that more than I would have expected. And then, of course, Edgar Kaufman, where he did Falling Water and tried to engage in a number of other projects with him that none of them ever quite took off. But um, yeah, I, I mean, what in the patterns? And seemed, Darwin Martin, of course. Darwin Martin, who was his you know long suffering, <laughs> loyal client who. Wright would hit up for money about every five years or five months, depending on the circumstance. And Martin would come through most times, you know? Um, yeah, but it did seem like the pattern was, as you said, in the beginning, Wright would sort of draw them into his lair. He loved for them to come to Taliesin and he would welcome them in, welcome them there. And they could see this, you know, this, this wonderful environment, this is, who I am, this is the kind of architecture I do. And it was all so seductive. But then very quickly, as you said, he, he was in, I'm sure many varied ways made clear who was in charge of this whole thing and would put them in their place. And often the relationships would become contentious. Um, not always, but there was a definitely a strong pattern of that. And one of the more interesting ones I thought, and I wasn't quite aware of the extent of this, but, um, uh, with the Guggenheim, Hilo Rabe, who was the you know, original director of that, um, they started off with this very kind of high-minded intellectual give and take. And then, you know, at some point, right, just kind of cut her off and cut her down. And it was, that was, that was pretty rough, <laughs> rough language there. And she, you know, she kind of disappeared from the project, not just because of right, but for other reasons too. But yeah, those, he, he was not, um, well, well, I was gonna say, he, he certainly wasn't afraid to alienate a client or any of that, but then strangely, there are, seemed to be number stories where he would get back together with them. You know, whether it's Herbert Jacobs after they did their second house and they kind of parted ways and the Jacobs were mad at him and he was mad at them. And but then they kind of get back together or if, of course, the primary one is Louis Sullivan, where late later in Sullivan's tragic final years, right, becomes that was a that was a very dear kind of portrayal of the two of them in those final years of Sullivan's life. So, and that just points to the whole complexity. Of him. He's he's has such a monstrous ego. He's so arrogant and so vain, et cetera, et cetera. But there are those moments that Hendrickson does portray that show you he's, he's a much more complex character than, you know, it's easy to stereotype him or pigeonhole him, but it's, there's, there is more to it than that. So, yeah. Absolutely. Well, listen, I want to invite our audience to please submit, submit comments or questions into the chat or into the, um, into the Q&A function of Zoom. We uh, really do wanna hear from you and we'd, we'd love to uh, bring you into the conversation. I wanna spend just a little bit of time on this uh, intermezzo. So here we have Wright coming all the way up to 1910-ish. Uh, remember uh, Roby House in 1908, 1909, uh, some of the work he did to his own studio, having the opportunity to be published uh, pretty prominently a couple of times. First in July, 1905, an architectural record where uh, a number of pages are devoted to his work and he's sort of lauded. Uh, but then given the opportunity in 1908 to present, I think it's 67 pages of his own work and submit this essay in the cause of architecture. He is riding high. Uh, he wants to be riding high. That's the person he sees that he is. He believes from day one that he is someone who is here to change architecture and he, uh, he works to do it. But then we get into this incredible period where not all that much is happening, right? So he does Midway Gardens. It's a little bit of a failure in uh, 1913 from an economic perspective. It was a fascinating place. And of course, we don't get to see it anymore because it's long gone. 
And he goes off to Japan and he works for a number of years building the Imperial Hotel. And the Imperial Hotel, as Hendrickson notes, is really renowned and remembered in history, largely for the fact that it survived against all odds and compared to uh, literally almost no other building survivors in that Tokyo earthquake in 1923. It survives largely intact thanks to the way Wright constructed that building. And then of course, um, he's doing in that same intermezzo period, uh, he's doing a house for Richard Lloyd Jones, his cousin in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I think the author takes a bit of, um, he takes a bit of a shot at the Richard Lloyd Jones house. I actually <laughs> tend to think it being uh, one of his very interesting uh, sort of changing style kind of buildings. So he's, he's working in the period of, let's say 1915 um, into the early 20s. He's working in California. He's experimenting with what he does here at the Richard Lloyd Jones house. And that is with this textile block style of architecture. It never really gets off the ground. And in some respects has been said to be the antithesis of much of what he stood about. He, he, he stood for, he was very much an architect that thought about the organics of architecture. He wanted houses uh, and buildings to be part of the landscape. And you can take a look at a few of the houses he did in the early 1920s, the Barnsdell house, for instance, in Los Angeles, as being something perhaps that uh, is a bit against the, uh, the, the natural setting that it's in. It's sort of standing up and clearly not being a part of the natural setting. Uh, so it's interesting, but he's working through this period. And I just wanna read this segment of the book. Just a, it's a long sentence that's actually a paragraph. So bear with me, it's on page 314 in the book, but I think it's a really interesting way of describing this period and then laying the groundwork for what comes next. So between late 1914, of course, after the tragedy and mid 1936, an interval of not quite 22 years, Frank Lloyd Wright got catastrophically involved with a mad morphine addict named Miriam Noel, built the Imperial Hotel in Tokyo, conceived a child out of wedlock, suffered Taliesin burning down again, spent a couple of nights in the head of the county jail in downtown Minneapolis on charges of moral turpitude, lost his house in foreclosure, lost his beloved and no longer estranged Liebermeister, experimented semi-successfully with textile block housing in California, got married for the third and final time, this time to a Montenegrin mystic, three, year, three decades his junior, gained Taliesin back, wrote his autobiography, built West Hope for his hot-headed first cousin in Oklahoma, went begging for work and clients, seethed at his professional obituaries, which always bothered him deeply, watched himself being replaced by lavishly embraced glass and steel European modernist darlings named Le Corbusier and Gropius and Van der Rohe, began what he called the Taliesin Fellowship, got his nose broken on Main Street in Madison, courtesy of an enraged ex-employee, and then Nearing the age of 70, and against all career and personal odds, came roaring back to something greater and even more arrogant than what he was before, if that can be imagined. And that sort of sets the stage for this next phase. And you and I have both been through it, Ed. It's amazing what happens next, right? In quick succession, it's almost like he's a new person in... Um, the mid 1930s, he does the Willie House. It's an amazing turn to a new kind of architecture. He does Falling Water, probably one of the most important buildings ever built in Western culture. He does, as you mentioned, um, the Herbert Jacobs House or Jacobs House One. He does the Johnson Wax Administration Building and then uh, a number of years later does, uh, and this is the, the main workroom in that administration building with its amazing skylit ceiling. And then a few years later, he does the tower. But all of this, all of this flurry of activity 
happening all at one moment in time culminates in him being once again raised up on a giant pedestal across the country and even worldwide uh, Time Magazine cover in early 1938. This man in early 1928, 10 years earlier, couldn't have been less significant, right? He's really out of the discussion. And now he's back and he's bigger than ever. And he just has come through this powerful stream of new architecture. And they talk about in the article, the architecture, they talk about the new Usonian houses he's doing. They talk about the Imperial Hotel. They show pictures of the Johnson Wax Building and Falling Water. So here he is, he's back, he's presented, and he's going to be bigger than ever. And you and I have talked about productivity in the early parts of his career and productivity later in his career. And you know, I know you know some great statistics about just what he did in the last 10 years of his life. Yeah, it was, and that was in the book. He does last 10 years, and he's in his late 70s and 80s, did 346 projects, built projects, which is unbelievable. Now, granted, not all of them were masterpieces. Some were quite dreadful, as we, we you and I have <laughs> talked about. But um, yes. that, regardless, uh, it's just it's a un, just a truly unimaginable almost to do to to be that productive particularly at that age of a time in his life it's just amazing yeah right exactly he was, and he really and he really does have one of the largest bodies of work of any architect in history probably the largest body of work of any architect in history isn't that right i would think so yeah yeah I mean, by, by hundreds by of projects this of, isn't by a long shot yeah, yeah this isn't a photo finish this is He's in a class all by himself and yeah. other architects have done far fewer projects. Um, yeah, I, think, I think one thing that's kind of emblematic of, of that period in the late twenties when he really, I mean, the, the, the anecdotes about him, about Old Havana, his last wife, writing notes to, to relatives and in-laws begging for $50 so they can buy food. I mean, it was, they were really, they were down, and, and, and of course, the reason they invented this Taliesin Fellowship was a way to make money. You know, he, you know, he had no work. So they thought, and it, granted, it was very much in keeping with how he, the kind of, his spirit of apprenticeship, he, he, he wanted video, but he thought, well, people can pay to come here and they can do work for me and we'll give them room and board and we'll make a little money and that'll be great. But it was a money-making venture from the outset, which is, you know, all the other high-minded things that have ever been said about it, much of true. It did start with that just, you know, kind of desperate need to make some money. So, yeah, amazing. So one of our uh, one of our audience members today asked the question, and I'm going to be interested to hear your answer to this, Ed, and then I'll give my own answer. Um, why did Wright not get much in the way of commercial projects? Wow, um, that is a good question. I'm sure people much more knowledgeable than me has probably explored that. But I mean, a simple answer might be that his success was in those prairie style houses, which were uh, you know, extremely inventive, sort of a radical reinvention of American architecture. And oh. maybe he's a victim of that success. Uh, I don't know. I think there. I think that's a that's potentially a good way to describe it. I'm going to pose a couple of other. Uh, potential ideas, because I'm not sure that this question has been answered well uh, in anything yeah, I, that I've ever read. But I think there, there, there are a couple of things working here, right? So he's early on in his career uh, in the 90s, and he's working uh, with Silsby and then early on with Sullivan. Sullivan has the potential to be a major player in commercial architecture, but somehow sort of loses his way. But the, but the real game in town in commercial architecture 
in the 1890s and into the early part of the 20th century is on tall buildings. And Wright never really gets into that space. He, um, it may be that he uh, just doesn't, his firm never has that presence in the commercial architecture space, so he's not being sought out. You and I both love the San Francisco Call Building, the newspaper project he did. It was a tower, it never got built. Um, if you ever see pictures of Wright standing in Taliesin West, you'll often see it, him standing in front of the San Francisco Call Building. It's, it would have been a beautiful tall building, uh, but he never really gets the opportunity. And I wonder if he had stayed on with Sullivan or maybe moved around to a couple of the other big firms in Chicago architecture. Of course, Chicago architects at that moment in time were very much in the commercial space, just not right. And then I wonder if um, maybe as he's moving through some of those uh, war years, World War I, you know, of course, there's the Roaring Twenties where he practically is unemployed. People are building things everywhere and he barely has any business, commercial or non-commercial, and then, of course, you get into the worst years of the Depression, uh, beginning in 1929 and into the early years of the 1930s. And there's really just not much work to go around for anybody uh, until everything starts to pick up for Wright in about 1934, 1935. He did have a few projects along the way, uh, but they never really snowballed into that next sequence of projects. Yeah, and I think something we haven't brought up here, but we talk at length about it in our, our classes on right, is the Columbian Exposition in, in Chicago in the right. 1890s, where that was kind of the resurgence of the Beaux-Arts classicism. And that became kind of the, the preferred architecture of the money class for quite a while. So right. that- And he wasn't interested in that. He, no, he, he did not, that, that was against his principles. He didn't believe in it. It was, yeah, just anathema to how he's, what he thought architecture should be. And to his credit, he never tried to play that game. Um, so that, that probably hurt him. I mean, if he, he wanted, it would have been a sellout from his perspective. And so, I, think that, I think you're absolutely right there. Um, and, you know, maybe this is a good time to go to another question from our um, audience today. Um, can we speak more about the specific landscape influences of the environment of the upper Midwest that influence Wright and which elements of Wright's signature designs are still seen today? How does Wright's decision, how do Wright's decisions speak to current conversations on climate change? There's a lot in that question. Uh, uh, by someone who uh, I know is very smart. So she's asking the right questions. Yeah. Um, wow, that, that's a very big question. Well, I, you know, I would have to, as far as the influence of the Wisconsin landscape, he did work as a farmer with his family. I mean, they, he worked in the fields. He, you know, plowed and cultivated land. I mean, that was a significant part of his growing up there. So he was physically in touch with the land. I have to believe that was a big part of it. And you know uh, what, Ed, I think just, just sort of merging this question with our previous one uh, and sort of that commercial work aspect of his practice, he really was anti-urban. You and I have talked about this many times. He felt like America, the true America, was the vast wide open plains and he wanted architecture to spread out on the plains. He wanted it to become one with the plains. And so that's why you see him very much inhabiting the horizontal space, as opposed to that urban vertical kind of architecture, which of course is, is gonna be um, largely commercial. I mean, even an apartment building is a commercial enterprise uh, done by some developer, uh, hoping to make money on it as, as a commercial enterprise. Uh, so, you know, it's all, he's really all about, it's not, does it influence him? Does the landscape influence him? The landscape is him. He yeah. is where he's come from and his architecture is about where he's come from. And when you think about first principles for right, and he wrote and spoke about it 
many times, and we the, the the term organic architecture kind of has taken over or sort of stands for his whole view of nature. But learning from nature was the first principle. Everything true and good could be learned from nature. That's the way. I mean, it was. You're right. That that was the essence of who he was and his architecture. And, and there are many examples where you could argue, well. You know, that one doesn't seem to spring from those principles, but in large part, I think much of his work does. When you think about the architecture, his architecture that still exists today, that still influences what's done today and how that might um, have an impact on our current conversations on climate change. He's the father of the ranch house. The ranch house really is right, right? The spreading out of space on one level not two or three levels. Uh, and so he, uh, you know, forms that are very much a part of the residential architecture lexicon today are directly descended out of right. I think we can be pretty firm in that. And then when you think about sustainability, he is the originator of passive solar, right? He's opening these houses up on, you know, with glass walls, like we're seeing here in the Herbert Jacobs house. Uh, where you're mitigating, but inviting in that light, right? So you don't want it to do a solar overload from a heat perspective, but you want to dump the light into the house, the natural light. That's all about sustainability. He's about natural materials, um, wood. Uh, wood is about as sustainable a material as you can get when you're building uh, anything, right? Uh, it's renewable. Um, and it's also biodegradable when you're done with it. Uh, so it's sort of a perfect kind of construction material. Yeah, and uh, the Jacobs house is a great example too of, I mean, in, with his focus on the use of is off and on, you know, for the last 40 years or, you know, 35, 40 years of his career. I mean, that was sort of a, uh, a lesson in efficient, organization of space and the whole point was to make it affordable um so there's you know no wasted space no frivolous trivial rooms for this or that of course he had to tell you what his view of frivolous might be but and then in this of course this is where he started doing the radiant heat flooring um which i don't know how that played in or play, would play into it now in terms of sustainability but that it's certainly endured and now it's evolved. And now that you see that kind of radiant heat in a number of um, what would be called sustained houses today. Um, but yeah, not, the other thing that is interesting, I think a big, a big element of sustainability is longevity. And so a house like the Jacobs looks as relevant today as it did when he built it in 30, when it was built in 36. Granted, it takes a lot of loving care to maintain a house like that over all these years, but part of longevity is beauty, that people want to live in these houses and they're, they have that certain sense of space and natural light and all those things. So that that is a big factor in sustainability that I think often gets kind of cast as, set aside for more um, technology oriented things. So I think that's a factor here. And the, and the Jacobs house is a really good example of that. So. Yeah, I would agree. Um, I've just gotten a really uh, wonderful note through our chat that um, the author Paul Hendrickson has actually joined in on our conversation. So <laughs> I'm not sure that it, I'm not sure that just, so we have to be on our best behavior now, but I'm not sure that there's a, uh, any way that we can easily turn on his microphone if he wants to say anything. I'll leave that to you, Laura, to figure out. But if not, um, Mr. Hendrickson, uh, we welcome any comment that you want to post in the chat. And we'll just continue uh, on with our presentation. Um, yeah, I would just, yeah, it's an honor that you're here. And I, yes. I, I know that you, you're acquainted with uh, Professor Henry Hart. And I don't know if that's what what led you to be here, but it's great that you're here. And we've, we've your ears were probably burning. Uh, we, <laughs> we, we both really, really 
uh, appreciate and enjoy this book greatly. So, and um, I think Laura has managed to turn on Mr. Hendrickson's uh, microphone. So, uh, you are welcome to join the conversation at any moment. Yeah. Oh, can you hear me? Otherwise, I'll just write a note. No, we, we can, can hear, hear you perfectly. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. Um, well, uh, thank you very much. And I'm a great, great admirer of all things William and Mary and in that beautiful, in that beautiful city town. And um, I had a son who almost went to William and Mary. And, and, and yes, I've come lately to have a virtual email uh, friendship with Henry Hart. And uh, he spoke highly of you two. And uh, so I, I actually, it's an, this is a terrible embarrassment of riches. Please forgive the immodesty, but it, the, the, this is a, a, a crazy thing, but it's 7 p.m. this very evening. The Library of Congress is airing a program in which they did interview me for a couple of weeks ago, and that goes out tonight at 11 o'clock. It's called, it's part of the Library of Congress's Making the Book, and it's about using the resources of the Library of Congress for the various nonfiction books that I've written because we lived on Capitol Hill in Washington for many years. And those three magnificent buildings of the Library of Congress are like home libraries. But when I found out that William and Mary was also doing something, and then when I found out that the museum director and a architect and a professor of art were chatting back and forth, I thought, I don't think you should tune in, Paul. I, I, I think they will, uh, they will rightly find a lot of fault. Uh, so um, just a few minutes ago, I got on and I have to get off in a few minutes, but I, I really did want to hit the chat function and thank you and your viewers. Uh, you're, doing them, you're doing them a service with these book programs. And, and I would like to dial into a future one that has zero to do with me, <laughs> but I'll, I'll just look on the website. Well, uh, we really appreciate you joining in and, and understand you have a tight schedule. And I can tell you, you've only been tuned in for a while, but Ed and I have taught a course on Frank Lloyd Wright several times here at William & Mary, a full semester, four credit course. And uh, we know a lot of the Frank Lloyd Wright story, but we learned uh, more, uh, particularly some of the deep details by reading your book, which for us was part review and also part um, consuming more details. So thank you very much. And I'll also tell you that one of our viewers asked me to let you know that your book on Hemingway was also a fabulous book. So you have a fan club within our gathering tonight. Well, that's, that's enough burning of the ears for me. <laughs> I, think I'll, I think I'll sign off, but um, thank you very much for doing the work. Oh, well, thank and, you for and, being here. And, for, and for, for having this show tonight. Thank you. Well, thanks we for coming we're, coming we're happy to have you. Um, Ed, let me just uh, follow in uh, into that sort of additional space on right. Because one of the things that you and I have spent a lot of time talking about is uh, he's sort of his own full-time five-person PR staff throughout his entire life, right? So he's very self-absorbed, as we mentioned before. He is has an ego that um, always manages to soar to a new height. Uh, he's out there constructing his own myth. You and I were talking about what the author um, revealed to us, which we found to be fascinating. His nearly completed degree at the University of Wisconsin was really a barely started academic exercise, right? Uh, so yeah. that's yeah. a really big story to be telling. Um, you know, a, a sequence of increasingly sophisticated falsehoods about a college education throughout his life. So he yeah, makes the story never, up that he wants. He never backed down on that. Yeah. He never backed down. <laughs> I remember in some of the research I was doing at uh, Museum of Modern Art, 
on modern architecture and some of their early exhibitions, in particular, the very important 1932 exhibition on the international style. And I came across a letter that Henry Russell Hitchcock, one of the curators of that exhibition, and as we noted earlier, a very important architecture critic and a longtime friend of Wright, but this was earlier in their friendship, uh, or maybe it wasn't even a friendship at that moment in time, but the essential point of the letter to Wright was Henry Russell Hitchcock saying, I'm sorry I ever got to know you. You are an absolute impossible person to work with. And every time I think you've gone to the limit, you take it 10 steps further. <laughs> and that's sort of circulating all around that international style exhibition, uh, which Wright felt like should have only been about him and not about any of the Europeans uh, that were being presented or any of the other Americans for that matter. He couldn't stand to share the stage with anybody. Yet some of the best architects seek him out from around the world. And all he wanted was the entire world to make architecture like he made it. And then when anybody did, he called them on the carpet immediately and said, you're copying. So yeah. it, it doesn't even square from that perspective. I mean, you and I both know he had Richard Neutra and Rudolf Schindler uh, basically idolizing him throughout their careers, even though they went in different directions and he couldn't give them the time of day uh, and often looked at them as and put them down as copyists and people without original ideas. And of course they had many original ideas, but it sort of all then begins to culminate. He's riding this new high wave through the late 1930s and into the 1940s and into the early, early 1950s. And once again, he connects through with Edgar Kaufman and manages to get an exhibition done in Europe and also in Philadelphia. And then it grows and morphs and becomes 60 years of living architecture at the site of where he will build the Guggenheim Museum. And it's an amazing exhibition. A whole series of pavilions are built, including, and you can see some of the exhibition hallway here. This is in 1953. Some amazing models. That's the Price Tower. And you can see close to the ground one of the models that they had developed for his idea of what America sh should look like. And that was Broadacre City. I mean, even the temporary structure for that exhibition, I think is really quite remarkable. I mean, it's a, this, yeah, yeah. Right. It's, it's it, a, well, by structure, you mean the exhibition structure and the house, right? It, it, yeah, the house itself, right. The, the, the shelter for, that, the, for the exhibit is amazing. So they actually There's build the, a, a Usonian, yeah. Usonian house here on the site yep. and people get to come and see it and right gets to pretend like he's living in it uh, <laughs> right there on Fifth Avenue in New York. Actually, can I share one thing that I've heard? Please do. Just before we started this almost, I was um, looking up, trying to find a recording of Wright's father's compositions. And I found a thing with the Chicago Historical Society. And I can't remember the person's name, I'm sorry to say, but he, he mentioned um, why Wright sort of excluded his father from any, any credit, any, any mention of, as being an influence of his life. And this historian speculated he did that with everyone who was an influence. He would deny them and exclude them, including his father. That was his theory. He said, why would he do it? Because he didn't want to give anybody credit who was right. important to him. So I've never, right. never heard that theory, but I, it's rings fairly true based on what's read. It so. does ring fairly true. Well, um, Ed, I don't know if you have any parting comments. We want to wrap this up. Um, Gosh, uh, I'm just, I'm really amazed that we got to have the author here for a minute. But um, again, and now we're not here to, we're not shilling for the book, but if anyone in the audience, you know, has an interest in right, I really think you'll find it to be ex an extremely enjoyable read. And I was going to also mention another book that it's fiction, but it's by, um, by uh, T.C. Boyle, and it's called The Women. 
and it's a fictional account of rights of the women in his life. And it's, it's a clearly a pretty well researched book, even though it is fiction. And it's, it was, I was happy to have read that particularly when Hendrickson writes about Miriam Noel, because there's, he has a quite elaborate uh, vision of what <laughs> those years with her were like, and it's pretty hellish. So anyway, that's an interesting book too, that would be a, there's a million books on right, but yeah. But there really you know, are. Henderson I have two shelves of them in my office here. Yeah, right. uh, I want to thank everybody for joining in tonight. Uh, Ed and I really appreciate you joining the conversation. We had fun reading the book and we hope you did as well. And if you haven't read it, please do. I want to tell everybody, come to the museum. We are now reopened to the general public. We're gradually putting COVID behind us and we want to see you in the building. We have a couple of really great exhibitions up. So we hope you'll stop by and see what we're offering. Have a great evening. And if we don't see you, have a great summer and we'll see you again in the fall. Ed, thank you for joining. And thank you, Laura, thank you for being our producer tonight. Have a great night, everybody. So thank long. You. Good night.